Good morning and welcome, people of God. My name is Randy Romsdahl. I'm a retired uh, pastor. I was senior pastor at St. James Lutheran in Crystal until about a year ago when I retired. My spouse Diana is with me here today, and it is just such a, a wonderful blessing to be able to come to be with you. My friend Ryan invited me way last January if I, to come and, and preach on this Sunday. I admire Ryan uh, greatly. He was a part of our weekly pastor's Bible study when I was at St. James, and he, um, he gives me hope for the future of our church. I also draw a great hope from your presence. Now, we look around and we say, boy, this pandemic has not made, uh, made church attendance any easier, and that is for sure. But one thing we need to keep in mind is there's a whole host of folks who are not sitting here, but who are still a part of this worship service. But I commend you for your faithfulness, whether you're at home or whether you're here sitting in the pews today. Your faithfulness, your determination, the persistence that you bring uh, to your following Christ in the world. And a bit later in announcements, you'll hear about Ash Wednesday services this coming Wednesday. Uh, but this is Transfiguration Sunday, the last Sunday you might say in the church year before we enter into that 40-day uh, uh, period of Lent. So with that, uh, beloved in Christ, let us stand as we are able for confession and forgiveness. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God who creates us, redeems us, and calls us by name. Amen. Beloved, let us confess our sin in the presence of God and of one another. Most merciful God, we, we confess, confess that, that we have sinned, sinned against you and your beloved, beloved children. We have turned our faces away from your glory when it did not appear as we expected. We have rejected your word when it made us confront ourselves. We have failed to show hospitality to those you called us to welcome. Accept our repentance for the things we have done and the, the things, things we, we have left undone. For the sake of Jesus Christ, Christ have mercy on us. us. Forgive us and lead us, that we may bathe in the glory of your Son, born among us, and reflect your love for all creation. Rejoice in this good news. In Christ Jesus, your sins are forgiven. You are descendants of the Most High, adopted into the household of Christ, and inheritors of eternal life, live as freed and forgiven children of God. Amen.
the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. You may be seated. In peace, let us pray. from above and for our salvation let us pray for the peace of the whole world for the well-being of the church of God and for the unity of all let us pray and praise, let us pray to Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. Amen. Amen. pray. <clears throat> Holy God, mighty and immortal, you are beyond our knowing, yet we see your glory in the face of Jesus Christ. Transform us into the likeness of your Son, who renewed our humanity so that we may share in his divinity. Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. A reading from the book of Exodus. Moses came down from Mount Sinai. As he came down from the mountain with the two tablets of the covenant in his hand, Moses did not know that the skin of his face shone because he'd been talking with God. When Aaron and all the Israelites saw Moses, 
the skin of his face was shining, and they were afraid to come near him. But Moses called to them, and Aaron and all the leaders of the congregation returned to him, and Moses spoke with them. Afterward, all the Israelites came near, and he gave them the commandments, all that the Lord had spoken with him on Mount Sinai. When Moses had finished speaking with them, he put a veil on his face. But whenever Moses went in before the Lord to speak with him, he would take the veil off until he came out. And when he came out and told the Israelites what he had been commanded, the Israelites would see the face of Moses, that the skin of his face was shining. And Moses would put the veil on his face again until he went in to speak with him. Word of God, word of life. Thanks Thanks be to God. God. A reading from Paul's second letter to the church in Corinth. Since then we have such a hope. We act with great boldness, not like Moses who put a veil over his face to keep the people of Israel from gazing at the end of the glory that was being set aside. But their minds were hardened. Indeed, to this very day, when they hear the reading of the Old Covenant, that same veil is still there, since only in Christ is it set aside. Indeed, to this very day, whenever Moses is read, a veil lies over their minds, but when one turns to the Lord, the veil is removed. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And all of us, with unveiled faces, seeing the glory of the Lord as though reflected in a mirror, are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. For this comes from the Lord, the Spirit. Therefore, since it is God's mercy that we're engaged in this ministry, we do not lose heart. We have renounced the shameful things that one hides. We refuse to practice cunning or to falsify God's word. But by the open statement of the truth, we commend ourselves to the conscience of everyone in the sight of God. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. Holy Gospel according to Luke. Glory Glory to you, O Lord. Lord. Now about eight days after these sayings, Jesus took with him Peter and John and James and went up on the mountain to pray. And while he was praying, the appearance of his face changed and his clothes became dazzling white. Suddenly they saw two men, Moses and Elijah, talking to him. They appeared in glory and were speaking of his departure which he was about to accomplish at Jerusalem. Now Peter and his companions were weighed down with sleep, but since they had stayed awake, they saw his glory and the two men who stood with him. Just as they were leaving him, Peter said to James, Master, it is good for us to be here. Let us make three dwellings, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah, not knowing what he said. While he was saying this, a cloud came and overshadowed them, and they were terrified as they entered the cloud. Then from the cloud came a voice that said, This is my son, my chosen. Listen to him. When the voice had spoken, Jesus was found alone, and they kept silent, and in those days told no one any of the things that they had seen. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise Praise to you, O Christ. Grace and peace from 
our Creator, and from our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. We've been through a lot. Jesus' disciples had been through a lot. And his chosen three, Peter, James, and John, had been through a lot with him, through many trials. Peter had just been told eight days earlier that he had taken on the role of Satan in Jesus' life. And Jesus said, get behind me. They did get behind Jesus. They got behind him. They went up the mountain for Jesus to pray. Now, we might wonder why would Jesus need to pray? After all, we Christians believe that he is always, 100% of the time, completely and totally the living God. So is he having a conversation with himself? Dear Lord, yes. Can you just imagine kind of how that prayer looks? However, I submit to you that that, that little um, paradox invites us into a prayer life of contemplation. And if we think about it, we know that as Christians, the living God dwells within us, and we have been poured out with the power of the Holy Spirit, upon, the Holy Spirit's been poured out upon us. So like Jesus, we don't need to, to do the shuffle for prayer. We simply need to listen. And as Jesus listened, something quite remarkable happened. He began to glow. But this sermon isn't about a glow-in-the-dark Jesus. The two who um, appeared with him, Elijah and Moses, had their own glow-in-the-dark experiences. Moses, we'd read about in the Old Testament reading, and Elijah, as we remember, was lifted up instead of dying into the clouds in a chariot of fire. Another interesting correlation with Elijah, Moses, was not actually, his death was not witnessed by the people. If you remember, when they were crossing over into Israel, God commanded Moses to stay behind because of some bad stuff that he had done on the 40-year journey. And so he went up in the mountains and died alone. Jesus has been talking with his disciples about his impending death. And he is preparing himself to go to Jerusalem to meet what the Roman Empire has in mind for him. Yes, there's a lot on their minds, just as there is with us. Who would have thought, last summer when I was here preaching, when we were outdoors in that beautiful summer day, that we would still be wearing masks? Who would have thunk it? I don't know about you, but I hate wearing masks. But I've done it for over two years, and I'll keep doing it as long as the public health authorities tell me that that's the appropriate way to love my neighbor. Because that's what we do, isn't it? We do what we need to to love our neighbor. And after all, isn't that what Jesus is about to? In this glow-in-the-dark experience that we find Jesus giving us, he is revealing his nature. On the one hand, he's revealing the nature of God, his, his godness, but he's also revealing the nature of of God's presence in our lives. A presence that continues with us despite pandemic, despite all of the stuff that we are grappling with today. In my own heart, I feel two stones pressing down, pressing down. My heart aches for the people of Ukraine. I'm sure it brings many of us to tears to see these families trying to live their lives, trying to do their, the right thing, to try to raise their children, and to try to do it, honoring the humanity of their neighbor, the God-createdness of their neighbor in the form of democracy. For you see, that's the 
one great thing about our nation, yeah, we have a great military, we have a stable government, we have an incredibly uh, robust economy, all that stuff is, how, how could you not like that? But the greatest thing about our nation, the only thing great about our nature, nation is the principle that we are each created equal by our creator. That's the great thing. And whenever we stray from that, then we cease to be the nation God intends us to be. Now, Putin is being portrayed as an evil, sinister villain. And I have no compunction about saying that, yes, Putin is committing evil, horrible acts. He is committing murder against the people of Ukraine. He's committing murder against his own people by sending their sons and daughters into battle to be killed as oppressors rather than as those trying to lift up and protect the humanity of their neighbor. But let us not slip into that position where we can start naming Putin as the embodiment of the devil in the world, and he, he needs to be taken out. His actions are certainly evil, but he is created by God. He is loved by God, just like every one of us. That's what we claim as Christians. And I submit to you that Vladimir Putin is doing his very best kind of dismaying, isn't it? That someone's very best could look like that. It's heartbreaking. I can only imagine the, the sorrow that God experiences when his beloved do their best, and that's what we end up with. But Jesus has come, and through this divine grace that he brings into the world, through his birth, his life, his death, his resurrection, and his ascension, we know. We know that God's love extends to all humanity, all people, all nations, good, bad, indifferent. We know, too, that his power resides in each one of us. I mean, those of us here this morning might look around and say, well, wait a minute, there's a lot of empty pews here. I and mean, that's great for COVID, but I sure would love to be in a sanctuary filled to overflowing. I'd like to see some folding chairs out and back there. We all would. But could it be that that is not really the sort of thinking that our Lord invites us into? Jesus didn't invite a whole army of disciples up on that mountain to see the, the fireworks. He invited three. And for some reason, God has invited you at home and you in the pews to be here. Not just to burn up an hour on Sunday morning, to be deep but to be transformed, to be made new, to have the joy of the presence of Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit that dwells within you, to have that be renewed and refreshed, to be nourished in Holy Communion. And that's why we're here. And because of us being here, God's power is unleashed into the world. We can truthfully say that God's power is revealed in weakness. And I'm sure we're all feeling kind of weak about that. In these difficult times, I look for moments of grace and humor. And this morning as I was taking my shower, I pulled the, the shampoo off the little shelf there, and I, and I looked at it, and every time I look at the label, I chuckle because it says that this is good for promoting curls in your hair. <laughs> I'm still using it, 
but I just have not seen the results. But maybe that's what a life of faith is. You just keep on keeping on. And that brings me to the second stone that weighs on my heart. You see, I have a granddaughter. In fact, I have three granddaughters and a grandson, all of whom are the children of South Sudanese immigrants. They were all born in this country to immigrant parents. And I think back to how I raised my own Korean son who came to our family when, I was, when he was 15 months old, and I think about how much I thought that just love and nurture and a close family could, could protect him from the racism that my home community practiced and didn't even recognize. I didn't recognize it. Maybe that's the sneaky way of our own sin. It's that stuff that we don't, that doesn't really bother us because we don't see it. It's hidden in plain sight. Much like Jesus is hidden in plain sight. Jesus is hidden in this small group of, of revolutionaries who are prophets for the power of God's love into this world, who are living, breathing vessels of the gospel of Jesus Christ. So I ra- Diana and I raised our son Lee as best we could, and he is a marvelous young man. He's 40 years old. But the pain he endured that I was not even aware of breaks my heart. My not seeing, my unawareness, my lack of sensitivity, when I thought I was the most sensitive, caring Christian man that you'd ever meet, I would never do a mean thing to any person of color because of their color. I wanted to be colorblind. Everyone gets a fair shake. Everyone's treated equally. But friends, that's not the way this world is set up. Last Sunday, I preached about racism at a small rural church, the one Diana and I were married in 45 years ago, to my friends and neighbors and family. And many people after church, as they went out, thanked me for uh, my sermon. But the next day, the congregation president called me and said, a lot of people upset about that sermon about racism. We're not racist. And he proceeded to kind of give me this laundry list of people, of reasons why the community that I grew up in, that I lived in until I was 31 years old, why it wasn't racist and it wasn't a white supremacist community. And white supremacist, white supremacy is not even a thing and systemic racism is not even a thing. And that's those black people's fault. Why do they live in, in those inner city places? Why don't they move out to Butterfield, Minnesota, where the land of opportunity is, even though most of the young people move away as soon as they leave high school? But nonetheless, that community is a community of good people. You need help, they're there. I love those people. I love that community. I love the culture I grew up in. And I hate the fact that it's completely blind to white supremacy and racism. Yes, there are people of color living there. They all work in chicken slaughtering plants and janitorial jobs and other jobs that do not require great English language skills. And everybody's very comfortable with that. But I haven't seen any persons of color serving on the council of the churches or serving as their pastors. So friends, I don't know where you are at on your journey, but we white people can tend to think, well, that is kind of a black person's problem. That's a, that's a Latino person's problem. That's an Asian person's problem, and I'm rooting them on. I'm right behind them. Just like Jesus' disciples were behind him as he went into Jerusalem. God calls us to be courageous witnesses and to be 
courageous in looking deep into the nature of sin in our communities, in our world, and in our hearts. That sin doesn't have to be about doing something naughty to somebody else, about being mean or saying the wrong thing. In fact, that is so um, paralyzing for us white people to talk about racism because we're so afraid we're going to say something wrong, that we're going to offend someone. So we say nothing, which is the biggest offense of all. I'm not here to make any of us, this white man and, and any of you, feel guilty or shamed. We are exactly the people we were raised to be and that God has created us to be. I feel grateful for every single attribute of my character and my upbringing, my racial and cultural identity. But all of that comes with responsibility, doesn't it, friends? That just as the leaders of this world have a responsibility to look deep and to act out of the basis of the truth and not some Russian fantasy, we are called to be truth seekers to be truth tellers and to be love sharers. We can all do this. We can all do it because the Holy Spirit resides deep in our hearts, even amidst the stones that weigh us down. And as we enter into the season of Lent, dear friends, let us not be weighed down by the trivial concerns of this world. Let us come forward and be renewed and refreshed in our hearts of faith through repentance, reflection, and listening prayer. Listening to the God that is so close, we're embodied by God. Beloved, may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace and believing that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Holy and beloved people of God, 
Please join me in confessing the faith we share in the ancient words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. We join in the prayers of the people. The Spirit of the Lord is poured out upon us in abundance so that we are bold to pray for the church, the world, and all that God has made. Transform us by your greatness, O God. Send us down the mountain to share joy with all people. Make us agents of change, confident that your hope will vanquish despair. God of grace. Hear our prayer. Mountains and valleys sing your praise, bluffs built by ancient glaciers, canyons carved by flowing rivers, and sands shaped by ocean tides. For the beauty of the earth we give thanks. God of grace, hear our prayer. You love justice and establish equity. Strengthen leaders of local governments, community nonprofits, and grassroots campaigns. Move us to be faithful in working to end racism and all forms of discrimination. Build up safe and joyful communities where all people may thrive. God of grace. Hear our prayer. Heal those who are in distress, especially the people of Ukraine and their neighbors, their families, and all who hold them close in their hearts of love. Give patience to those waiting for answers. Grant hope (coughs) to those who have reached the limits of treatment. We pause to offer up the names of those who need your grace and healing, silently or aloud. God of grace. Hear our prayer. Today we shout Alleluia from the mountaintop and we prepare to enter during this change of season, enter the wilderness of Lent. Bless all who prepare and lead us in worship during this change of season, pastors, deacons, musicians, and all who contribute to our worship life. God of grace, hear our prayer. We now take time to offer up any other prayers silently or aloud, for what else? to the people of God need to pray. God of grace. Hear our prayer. Blessed are they who listen to Christ's voice in this life and now rest with him. Transform us from glory into glory and give us your peace that we do not lose heart. God of grace. Hear our prayer. Since we have such a great hope in your promises, O God, we lift these and all our prayers to you in confidence and faith, through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. I invite you to note the February cause of the month, and I believe there's an offering plate in back where you may contribute to that uh, work. Lutheran Immigration and Refugee Services is a wonderful ministry of our church, and I'm sure that they are already... um, helping people who have fled Ukraine into Poland and other countries. You may be seated.
Blessed are you, O God, sovereign of the universe. You offer us new beginnings and guide us on our journey. Lead us to your table, nourish us with this heavenly food, and prepare us to carry your love to a hungry world. In the name of Christ, our light. Amen. Come to God's table. Even though we are scattered and we don't physically come close together, nonetheless, we sit at one table because God's Holy Spirit is with us and makes us one in Christ. There is a place for you and enough for all. Please join me in the celebration of Holy Communion. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is indeed right, our duty and our joy, that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you, almighty and merciful God, through our Savior, Jesus Christ. By the leading of a star, he was shown forth to all nations. In the waters of the Jordan, you proclaimed him your beloved Son. And in the miracle of water turned to wine, he revealed your glory. And so with all the choirs of angels, with the church on earth and the hosts of heaven, we praise your name and join in their unending hymn. Holy One, the beginning and the end, the giver of life, blessed are you in the prophets, hopes, and dreams. Blessed are you for Mary's openness to your will. Blessed are you for your Son, Jesus, the Word made flesh. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread. gave thanks to God, broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup. Once again, he gave thanks to God. saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. It is shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this in remembrance of me. Gathered into one by the Holy Spirit, let us pray as Jesus taught us. Our Our Father, Father, who art in heaven, heaven, hallowed be thy name. name. Thy Thy kingdom kingdom come, come. thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen.
I invite you now to take the bread and eat. It may be in your individual cup which you've picked up here at church. It may be at the table in your home. For this is the body of Christ given for you. I now invite you to take the wine and drink. The blood of Christ is shed for you. Amen. We join now in the prayer after communion. We give you thanks, gracious God, for you have, for we have feasted on the abundance of your house. Send us to bring good news and to proclaim your favor to all, strengthened with the richness of your grace in your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. The peace of Christ be with you always. Loved, please uh, share a sign of God's peace with one another, e even as we are spread out in this uh, holy place. And those at home, God's peace is with you as well. We embrace you. God's peace. Beloved in Christ, we join now in the benediction. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord's face shine on you with grace and with mercy. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Because we got a couple important ones. One is that we're going to have our an annual congregational meeting next Sunday. It'll be right after the worship service, so the worship service is at 10. The um, congregational meeting is at 11. It will be following right after the worship service. You can do either in person or by Zoom. Um, I believe that that uh, pastor has already sent out the um, Zoom link, so you've already got the link that will get you to the worship service and to the meeting. And so we will be um, voting on our officers and council members for next year and hearing the reports from all the current uh, members. Um, so I think that's it for that. The other announcement that we have is that this is Ash Wednesday. All of a sudden the month flips and we're going to have um, Ash Wednesday. So. Um, the second, there will be an in-person worship service at 7 here. There also will be Zoom, and we will be doing um, the Holden Evening Prayer, which is beautiful, and we love that. So 7 o'clock on this coming Wednesday. Um, so if anyone would prefer to do Zoom for the Ash Wednesday service, we do have ashes to go. They are currently out on the bench in front of the church, so you can pick them up as you leave if you prefer to do Ash Wednesday at home this week. Or if you're doing this by Zoom, you can swing by the church and just pick up some ashes to go. And just be sure that you mix them with oil rather than water. Um, that's just the way to do it so that you don't get any possible burn. Okay.
serve the Lord.